think my main problem is I can't walk. Well, not really. I've sort of got used to the way I am. May not be great, but there you go. Hello, Mick Scarlett for the studios. Disabled access? Round the back, I'm afraid. No, no, it's too short, mate. That's all right, mate. No, 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 no a lot of the time, people don't talk to you, they talk to your disability. They're uneasy. They don't know how to react. But why? Now think about it. When was the last time you saw a picture of a disabled person on your screen? On the side of a bus? Or in your paper? Adverts? No chance. Quiz shows? Nope. Blind dates? The places you do see images of disability can tell you a whole lot about attitudes towards disability like stories on the television news. This was the farthest he'd ever walked, and it wasn't easy. Or posters on the street. On the surface, nothing could be simpler, but behind those pictures lie assumptions and attitudes which can encourage us to look at disabled people in a certain way. As tragic and helpless, for example or as courageous superheroes overcoming enormous odds, or as frightening and sinister. Another place you meet disabled people is at the cinema. No, not sitting next to you, on the screen. Some of the scariest images used in cinema press panic buttons in us that go right back to our early childhood. Have you ever wondered why this is so scary? Please, God. This is God. But why do these things make us feel like that? If a man came down from Mars and the first person he met was Freddy, he probably wouldn't turn a hair. But we do. Do you remember when you were this young? Hansel thought the roof tasted very nice, and so he tore off a great piece, while Gretel broke a large round pane out of the window and sat down quite contentedly. Just then, the door opened, and a very old woman walking upon crutches came out. Hansel and Gretel were so frightened that they let fall what they had in their hands. But the old woman, nodding her head, said, Ah, you dear children, what has brought you here? Come in and stop with me and no harm shall befall you. I was sort of walking down the street um, with my dog on my way off to the leisure centre to have a swim. And um, there were some children in front of me and April was trying to sort of get round them. And the mother was somewhere else. I think she was a bit further on or behind me or something. And she just yelled at these kids, Daryl, get out of the way! In such an alarmist way, it was almost like the child was about to have boiling water poured over yeah. or something. What I was left thinking mm. was, put on top of that the other layer of, maybe these children will hear the story of Hansel and Gretel, mm. which says very clearly that witches have red eyes and can't see very far, <laughs> and that they eat children. <laughs> I was thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Northumberland Park School in Tottenham takes both disabled and non-disabled kids. Chantelle's brother has a severe learning difficulty. Yeah, people are scared of my brother because they've never been around people like that, disabled, and they're not really used to him. When I first went to Chantelle's house and I saw her brother, I was a bit, I was like a bit scared of him because I thought. Like, when I'm sleeping or something, he might come up to me and strangle me or something, but <laughs> afterwards, I, I got to know him and he was nice. He was just the same as everyone else. I used to have a dream, sort of like with Freddy Krueger. I was trying to cross the road, OK? Then everything just stopped dead still. And there was no, all the cars vanished from the road. And this sort of like, Freddy Krueger character came out, and I tried to run away. 
and it just felt like I was staying in one place and it was pulling me towards it and it felt really horrible. He was plainly blind, for he tapped before him with a stick and wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose and he was hunched as if with age or weakness and wore a huge old tattered sea cloak with a hood that made him appear positively deformed. I hear a voice, said he, a young voice. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me in? I held out my hand, and the horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a vice. On an unconscious level, people are certainly taking in, they're making the connection between impairment and evil, and this is sinister, you know, equals fear. They've all got disfigured faces. They've all got um, goggle eyes. They've all got something wrong with their body, like they're hunched or they're dirty. We are actually getting exploited, if you like. They are using us to make people scared, and we don't want that. We don't want to be objects that you see on TV and objects you don't see in the real world. Please, God. This is God. People um, are reminded of their own vulnerability when they're around disabled people. So it's not physically us they're afraid of. It's, it's aspects of themselves. They realize as human beings um, there are bits of their body which might drop off or they might lose the use of. And they don't want to be reminded of that. And so that that's why they want to, to shove us away and shut us up and not be reminded. Not very long ago, you could go to a circus or a fair and see what used to be called a freak show. A thin man, a bearded lady. Often, the people on display were disabled. The main character in The Elephant Man, a film set in the 19th century, is severely deformed. At the beginning of the film, he is an exhibit in a circus freak show. Ladies and gentlemen, the terrible elephant man. Stand up. Stand up. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. You know they say about don't judge a book by its cover. Well, um, when disabled people get stared at, that's what people are doing. They're judging the book by its cover. Some people that know, um, like, something about disabilities or anything like that, they treat you like, OK. But, like, people who don't know anything about it, um, they just, like, sort of stare at you. In the 18th century, you could pay to see mad people at the Bethlehem Hospital, Bedlam. This is an account of a visit by a horrified observer. I found a hundred people, at least, who, having paid their tuppence apiece, were suffered unattended to run rioting up and down the wards, making sport and diversion of the miserable inhabitants a cruelty which one would hardly think human nature capable of. I saw some of the poor wretches provoked by the insults of this holiday mob into furies of rage, and I saw the poorer wretches, the spectators, in a loud laugh of triumph at the ravings they had occasioned. But we don't do things like that anymore, do we? Here, listen to this one. What did the bus conductor say to the one-legged blind man with no arms? Oh, honestly. Oh, come on. Be fair. It's only a joke. Spoiled sport. Have you ever noticed how the easiest way to get a laugh is at the expense of someone different to you? People who drive larders, homosexuals, the Irish, the French, disabled people? I was getting on a bus from Tottenham Road, actually, and this young boy sort of said, um, didn't really approach me, but sort of said to me, um, um, he was sh sort of shouting across to me, saying, um, Mongol person with black hair with glasses on. I felt very angry and very hurtful inside, really. Um, I mean, 
kids of that age shouldn't be um, calling someone a name like that. I mean, I've had it like um, in, the, in, um, in an underground when my director at the time um, said, well, just don't take no notice. Um, but I do take notice of what people say to me. I was walking um, by these two boys. One of them turned around. It's obvious that he might have done something, so I called him a spastic. And I says to the boy, I said, excuse me, I don't like that. And they go, what? And then I says to them, like, as a disabled person, don't you think that's an insult to me? Don't you ever stop to think of the disabled kids and what they think? And he just said, no. No. You know, as if, oh, shut up, you're nothing, you're nobody. I can't be bothered to listen to you. You know, somebody might not say to me, are you blind or something? But they'll say that, say that to somebody if they've just crashed their car. Yeah. They'll say, are you blind or something? So it's saying, well, you know, it's sort of planting the idea that blind people are stupid. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody's not listening, they'll never, they'll, they'll say something, you know, you're deaf as opposed to something. So again, it's that idea that, you know, deaf people are stubborn, don't listen, you know. Mm. So it's all that sort of negativity which is around expressions which on the surface people are maybe trying to use in a humorous way. We don't have freak shows anymore. In fact, these days, we're more likely to see pictures like these of disabled people overcoming their disability in remarkable ways. So what do these images tell us about disability? There's something deep in us all that says normality is being able to do all the things that healthy, young, able-bodied people can do. And if for some reason or other you can't, then you're out of the game. I often feel that what disabled people are being offered is this notion of um, you're only a whole human being if you can walk. It might cause you loads of pain and you might end up crawling. But then, you know, the, the, the local paper gets hold of the story, triumph over tragedy, you know, the wheelchair-bound bride who, you know, walks down the aisle, and it's like, you're not whole unless, unless you can do that. Some disabled people see their disability as a challenge, something to overcome, and they do some amazing things to make up for it. For a little boy, once destined to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair, signing up for a mile-long sponsored walk was an act of courage Lovely. typical of 10-year-old Martin Conway. It was four years ago that ITN helped raise the funds to pay for his conductive education treatment. There are no miracles here, just months and years of hard work. And today, Martin's delighted with his improvement. If you're feeling really low and you feel there's nowhere to go in life, you look at people with disabilities who are really trying to achieve something and you think to yourself, well, if they can do it, why can't I? It makes disabled be proud of themselves to show, show, show that they are capable of doing things for themselves. I've, I've become a lot taller and I've started to walk around a stick a bit better than before. This was the farthest he'd ever walked and it wasn't easy. The last quarter of a mile of the course stretched his physical resources to the very limit. Martin Conway has every right to feel proud of his achievements. But should his story stand as an example for everyone? I think it's wrong is well, you have to prove yourself too much and sort of think, oh, I've got to be like this, where you don't have to be. Just be the person you are. And I love you to just the way you are. I just see you for what you are. And you don't have to pretend to be someone else. I mean, I feel in just the same way as disabled people are exploited in terms of passivity and pity. Um, very often disabled people are exploited in this sort of courageous overcomer type stuff. You know, in, in sort of weekly magazines, they, they call them TOTs. They know what they're doing. They call them TOTs. That stands for you know, triumph over tragedy. Hey, fellas, Long John Silver's got his undercarriage back. Oh, no. Hello. 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 H
How goes it, Douglas? Well, I got him. At least I look normal, as long as I don't move. Come on, let's see you do a circuit, Douglas. Reach for the Sky is a tribute to Douglas Bader, who lost his legs in a flying accident, but bravely fought back to become a Second World War flying ace. I think very often it puts disabled people under an awful lot of pressure. You know, there have been instances where, where people's story has been taken up by the media, by the press, and it's been exploited to such an extent that um, the expectations are so high that people have been unable to cope with it because the media have got hold of it. They've exploited it, this superhero idea. But one of the things that really frustrates you is society's attitude that you want to be cured that you're not happy with who you are, mm. um, you actually want to be them. Yes. The number of people that, that say to me, you know, are you ever going to walk again? I don't really care whether I walk again. I won't mind losing a few stone, but I really don't care about walking again. Now, I'm sure you've all seen my next guest before. You often see him on street corners, begging. He's out in all weathers, and he never complains. Please welcome Chip. Chip represents a view of disabled people as the object of charity and pity, a view that goes right back to the 19th century, but which is still with us today. Today, charity advertisements are the most public face of disability. Some charities, like Mencap, are beginning to change the way they portray disabled people. She's different, but her life doesn't have to be different. Um, I agree with the caption, but I don't agree with the picture, because the picture's saying like, she's little and she's lost. She knows she's different. She knows there's something wrong. Why am I so different to the rest of them? Where was the other, where's the new one? Right, the caption is no good, but the picture is saying, no matter what your disability, uh, no matter what your problem is, you can still carry on your normal life. In the same way that you'd, you'd maybe have a chocolate advert, that's selling desire. I mean, to my mind, the charity adverts, very often what they're selling is they're selling fear, they're selling pity. Um, they're, they're really, what they want is, to peop is for people to put their hands in their pocket and to fork out. There is a disease which is tearing apart the lives of thousands. It strikes at random, often with acute paralysis or damage to sight or speech, and is, as yet, incurable. find the cure, we need your help. It would make me feel sick that we, that I would be, I was portrayed like that, like a piece of ripped paper. At first I thought it was going to be a Carlsberg advert, because you normally hear that voice. If multiple sclerosis shattered your life, who'd be there to pick up the pieces? For more information, call us. My friend's mum has a miss. She's a very strong lady, and the last thing she would want is to, for people like you to feel sorry for her, because although she's confined to a wheelchair 14 hours a day, she still gets on with her life. She still has to do the things she's got to do. A person with MS, nine times out of ten, is confined to a wheelchair, has got virtually no muscle, and Yet they're using people, well, people who do bodybuilding every other day of the week, you know? The imagery and what it's saying about us and the reality of our lives is that we're, we're passive people, that we're tragic, we're incapable, we're helpless. Very often we're portrayed in black and white as well, which is reinforcing the idea of um, the passivity that surrounds us in our lives. You know, we're very often not in colour because <laughs> we're not bright, attractive, charismatic people. <laughs>
I thank all the gentlemen of the press and media here for the wonderful work you do in putting the achievements of these children into the face of your viewers and readers. You shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. That's where the colour comes into our lives, you see, if they can associate it with, you know, celebrities, well-known people. You know, Princess Diane, who is, is perceived as being a very attractive woman, um, you know, is helping um, an organisation which is connected with, with people less fortunate. So it's a, it's a big PR exercise a lot of the time. The companies are actually sort of, they're saying they're, they're hypocrites really because they get a nice boost if they go on sort of prime time television saying I've got um, such and such an amount of money for all these poor disabled people, uh, aren't we good? Hold on, hold on. Aren't we being a bit ungrateful here? Aren't charity fundraising days like Children in Need a good thing for everybody? Now, some of you may have helped raise money for Children in Need. I've done some work for charity myself. But a lot of disabled people disagree with this approach completely. Don't support the BBC's jamboree over the road. Don't go in. Some feel that TV charity extravaganzas keep alive old-fashioned images of disability and can shift attention away from the real issues. If you define disability in a political sense, it's actually looking at the way in which society disables us. So the problem isn't, isn't located in us as disabled people, the problem's in society. It's the steps, it's all that print information, um, it's things like the education system, we all get, you know, segregated off into special schools. Now all those things can change. You know, it might sound idealistic, but we can have laws that can protect us. The education system can change, attitudes can change, all those things can change. If you're just, you know, Joe Bloggs in the street, turn on BBC Two or Channel Four and there's a programme presented by a person in a chair or who's blind or who was whatever saying, Hi, welcome to Disability Issues. They're going, Oh well, click. But if you say you're watching prime time television, you're watching Top of the Pops. And on comes a guy in a chair and says, hey, next up, number three. That make any difference, because you only ever see them from there up anyway. And so what's the point? But if they did that, then kids, everybody, would have to change their attitudes, because that's put us on an equal par with them. I'd love to see um, dancing people to be on TV, um, in, ad in adverts, um, and a few soap operas like EastEnders and probably Neighbours, I think, you know. Even have more disabled people doing the news, if possible. It would make people more aware, and it would make people more understanding, and it would make people say, hey, she's got wheels instead of legs, so what? It's not a problem. Hey!